It, the terror from beyond space, has a mixed reputation, some lauding its achievements, others mocking it as another in a long string of low-budget sci-fi schlock to come out of Hollywood during the 50s. And it was intended to fit into that general mold, make no mistake, except that It did have some higher aspirations, and while it's not as timeless as last month's Godzilla was, its limitations are primarily that of the times rather than the overall story. And sure, there's plenty of snark fodder in there, as we'll see, but this is hardly some Planet of the Vampire Women or It Came From Beneath the Moon style of story. But its journey to the screen did have its origins in the world of low-budget 50 sci-fi. Unlike its predecessors, It was actually being done by United Artists rather than American International, the studio that was run by James H. Nicholson and Samuel Z. Arkoff, uh, not to be confused with Dr. Zarkov of Flash Gordon. AIP was an outgrowth of their previous business, ARC, but the same general principle of how to make money from movies applied. See, the 50s were when television was really beginning to take off, and it became a threat to the cinemas that were used to being the only game in town. That's when lots of things happened to try to bring people back into the theater. Now, one of those you might have noticed, again, with last month's Godzilla review, all of those black and white clips had one thing in common. None of them were in widescreen. That wasn't a mistake on my part. They weren't shot in widescreen. It didn't exist yet. Widescreen came about as one of these gimmicks. It was just one of the few that actually stuck. But with television drawing in the older audience, there was some nervousness about how much to invest in expensive science fiction films. AIP sought to fill the niche by appealing to the teen market that didn't want to hang out at home, so they went with a lot of dirt-cheap works with potential to draw in that coveted market. Hence the low-budget sci-fi film. And that spilled over onto IT itself. Incidentally, if you've noticed the strange way I've been pronouncing the word it, it's because I'm trying to distinguish the film title and the title character from the pronoun. So if I sound ridiculous, that's why. Anyway, if we're going to talk about low-budget films, then there is one name that's going to spring to mind. Roger Corman. And while I don't doubt that many are going to rise to his defense, well, I come to bury Corman and not to praise him. To give you some idea of how low-budget Roger Corman was, and possibly still is. The recent Sharktopus was his. He started directing movies not because he had some grand vision, but he discovered he could save so much money by just doing it himself. And nothing sells quality craftsmanship like saying, eh, how hard can it be? He irritated everyone by changing script on location if he thought something could be done cheaper or faster, even if it would ultimately hurt the picture. We meet up with Corman while he is working on a western called Five Guns West, but thanks to some problems, it ran over budget, so the only way to get the picture made was to take funds away from his other picture, a film with the quality-inspired title, The Beast with a Million Eyes. This left Corman in a bind because Corman had joined the Directors Guild of America and was forbidden from directing it because it was so dirt cheap that to work on it would violate union rules. Well, not willing to let a little thing like a living wage get in the way of sharing the beast with a million eyes with a world that deserved to see such greatness, Corman served as executive producer and got one of his underlings to direct it in his stead, although some rumors state that he wound up directing the film himself in an uncredited role. Other sources state that Lou Place handled that. Now, the reason for that stupid-sounding title, besides the fact that AIP would usually cook up a title and then tell people to work out the details of making a movie around it later on, was that the alien in the film was spying on us through the eyes of primitive Earth creatures. It was intangible. It wasn't a direct threat. It was a threat through all these other things. And that did make it a bit more imaginative than some of the expected stuff of 50 sci-fi. And that, of course, is what attracted Corman to the film. The chance to do this more highbrow concept, to really explore the art of the... Sun. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just messing with you. He said, hey... Your artsy-fartsy intangible menace means we don't have special effects for our monsters in this film. Or as we learned in director school, chiching. Well, imagine how annoyed the exhibitors of the film were to learn that there was, in fact, no monster in this monster movie. AIP had done all their promotional work on the assumption that there would be a monster. Huge promos of a creature too big to even fit on the poster. Well, this movie was already dreadful as it was. I mean, Corman was notorious for slashing budget everywhere and often hiring 
no talent actors to try to fill it in because they're so cheap. So taking all of the normal Corman stuff that you would expect and then tacking on no monster, the exhibitors were saying, guys, this is bad even by your low standards. Now, before you come leaping to the defense, listing all of the people that got their start because of Roger Corman, I know that. In fact, we're going to tie that in soon with a guy who's tied in with it. But the point is that a lot of the times, Corman just flat out cut corners and the film suffered because of it. If you watch The Beast with a Million Eyes, nobody in the film can act except one guy who must overact to try to compensate for all the other people who suck. But anyway... Corman found himself having to tack on some monster stuff, so he spoke with Forrest J. Ackerman about getting somebody to handle that, and Ackerman put him in touch with Ray Harryhausen. Well, Corman and Harryhausen go together like ice cream and shoe polish. There was no way a film so cheap that the unions hated it could possibly afford Harryhausen to work on it, so Ackerman said, well, okay, I have some other contacts. What's more in your price range? Well, Corman, being Corman, said... $200. Adjusted for inflation, that's roughly enough money to hire two office temps for a week. So Ackerman looked for someone with a level of experience for such a price, namely, none whatsoever. And he recalled that one of his cover artists, named Paul Blaisdell, was into science fiction and making model airplanes, and he had spent some time in his youth making puppets. Well, even Blaisdell wouldn't work for so little, so Corman agreed to double his price and was delivered a beast to put in his movie. Now, I know it seems like this is the world's longest tangent, but this all is going to tie in together later on. Blaisdell looked over the script to The Beast with a Million Eyes and concluded that the one thing he was not making is The Beast with a Million Eyes, because that was a malevolent force and not a physically manifest thing. And yet he learned from the script that somehow it had flown here in a rocket ship of some kind, even though it wasn't a corporeal creature. Therefore, there had to be something piloting that. Aha! Some kind of slave of the beast. And that's what he would be creating. Some poor creature that has been pressed into service of this malevolent entity. And from this, Blaisdell conceived of the entire backstory of this creature. The environment it would have developed in. And how much that would shape its appearance. And nobody at the studio gave a flying f*** about any of that. But this tells you all you need to know about Paul Blaisdell. He may have been an amateur, but he approached effects with the perspective of a world creator. Now, I say amateur because that's what he had been at the time, but that didn't last for very long. Blaisdell became synonymous with B-movie science fiction after that. Because even though his work wasn't well showcased in the film, Beast did make a small profit, and Corman was drawn to anybody who was willing to work for rates that would make a Ferengi blush. So Blaisdell was soon one of the go-to guys for low-budget Hollywood sci-fi pictures, including the MST3K featured The She-Creature with Blaisdell himself in the role of the title creature whose suit he designed. Now that was important because a lot of the lessons learned on that film would be instrumental for building the suit for it. And keep in mind that this was a costume that so pleased the studio that it was actually reused for other projects, and he improved upon that. Now, they were producing a hell of a lot of cinematic dreck, and yet AIP and Allied artists were making money hand over fist using this. And not just low-budget sci-fi flicks, but exploitation films as well. Somehow they'd found their own personal Rumpelstiltskin who could manage to spin turds into gold. And Universal had this huge string of monster hits going on. Well, for that reason, United Artists finally decided they were going to take a chance on breaking into the same market, and they chose to do that with IT. And to make sure that they could repeat the financial success of that, they went after Eddie Kahn, who directed She Creature, and Blaisdell. Well, Blaisdell had grown tired of being exploited in his work, so he said he was only going to take on it if he really liked the script. So that was on Wonderway, and the writer on that was none other than Jerome Bixby. And they were lucky with that, because this was Bixby's first script for film or television. But his later works were going to include It's a Good Life, one of, if not the most famous Twilight Zone episodes ever, four Star Trek episodes, including Mirror, Mirror, and one of my previous film reviews, The Man from Earth. Nothing unusual. Well, until one day I met a caveman who thought he was Jesus. Now, there's some debate over whether or not the film Alien is a rip-off or uncredited remake of It. And admittedly, there are a few similarities. I'm going to get into that at the end of the film. 
But it should be pointed out that its basic concept is itself based upon the work of A.E. Van Vogt, who created the concept of people trapped on a ship with an alien monster in his short story, Black Destroyer. I think the Black Destroyer was actually Sisko's boxing nickname. Anyway, that short story was reworked with several others into his later novel, The Voyage of the Space Beagle, and Bixby himself admitted that it was where he got the idea for the film. But as I've said before, the difference between an homage and a rip-off is whether you add value to the original premise, and in this case, I think Bixby did, enough that Blaisdell agreed to work on the project and develop the monster with Bixby, and because United Artists was a real studio that did it with a proper budget this time. Then they hit a snag. The costume had originally been planned to be worn by Blaisdell. He had usually done that in his films. But this time it was going to go to someone else. Ray Crash Corrigan. If you saw the classic film Ed Wood, you'll never forget the image of a washed-up, drug-addicted Bella Lugosi getting one last chance in films with the only person that was left in Hollywood who thought he was great and still a household name. Corrigan was actually somewhat similar at this time. He had been a big name back in the day, a Saturday matinee hero in the 30s and 40s. But he had a serious problem with alcoholism, and combined with his surly demeanor, he had been largely shunned by Hollywood by this time. But the producer thought that there was enough name recognition left to bring Corrigan back for this film, which proved a problem. Corgan refused to work with Blaisdell on the monster costume, even though that was one of the key elements this film was banking on. A terrifying juggernaut that wanted nothing more than to murder the crew. Corgan just gave Blaisdell his long johns and told him to make the damn costume from that. Well, the thing about long johns is that they show the dimensions of a lot of your body, but not your head. And Corrigan refused to come in and get a mold made of that, so with no other options, Blaisdell just used one of his existing molds and hoped for the best. The costume itself worked out much better because, as I said, he'd learned a lot working on the she-creature, and he was able to cover it with fake scales in such a way that it would allow unimpeded movement for Corrigan. The problem came when Corrigan put on the costume for the first time, and surprise, surprise, the headpiece wouldn't fit. When they put it on, Corrigan's chin would stick out of the mouth. So they painted Corrigan's chin to look like a tongue, looked at it, and said, Well, great, now our terrifying monster is going, Bleh? They added some more teeth in the hopes that they could make the monster more convincing, but sadly it wasn't terribly effective, and they mostly had to try to shoot around this issue when making the film to prevent the monster that was so terrifying from being goofy-looking. This was, sadly, only the start of the problems that they were having with Corrigan. Khan, who had taken the directing job, had a reputation as being a great director to work with, but that had largely been because he was working with professionals, as opposed to Corrigan, who regularly showed up on set completely plastered and just generally acting like the world's biggest asshole. Corrigan was so drunk that once when Khan kept telling him to lift his head, Corrigan didn't understand it until in the end, he thought, oh, I know what he means, and pulled the mask off instead. Also, playing a rampaging monster while you're completely drunk really plays havoc with expensive costumes, so they kept having to try to fix the thing while dealing with the surry, slurring Corrigan. Well, in a move that surprised no one anywhere, Corrigan never did another film again. And Corrigan's bad attitude quickly rubbed off on Shirley Patterson credited as Sean Smith in the movie, but more properly should have been listed as Unpleasant Shrew, because she was quickly pissed off at everybody for the way things were going on this film. And yet, despite all the hurdles, this film was completed and actually proved to be a success. So, let's get started with It, The Terror from Beyond Space!